Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, uh, where, we'll, where we'll be diving deep into the key role low carbon agricultural projects can play in corporate climate strategy and in achieving global net zero on a local scale. Uh, so we're very pleased to be welcoming you to this first joint webinar between Agoterra and Sol Capital, who've recently partnered up to accelerate this shift toward uh, regenerative and low carbon agriculture in Europe. So first, quickly introducing today's speakers, we'll be hearing from Andrew Voisey, who's a chief impact officer at Sol Capital. He led the creation of Sol Capital's carbon certification program. Uh, which rewards farmers for their regenerative agriculture transition and ecosystem services. And we'll also be hearing from Claire Gassia, who's Director of Agricultural Partnerships at Agoterra, which links companies with low carbon and local farming projects in Europe and specializes in carbon contribution in the agricultural sector. Uh, so for today's agenda, we'll first be diving into the shift away from compensation to contribution in corporate climate practice. Uh, we'll then focus on the role of the agricultural sector in particular in achieving global net zero and look at how a regenerative agriculture project can advance this goal in practice. And we'll end uh, today's session with a Q&A. Uh, so don't hesitate to send any question throughout the talk. And uh, thank you again for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, I'll now give the floor over to Claire. Thank you, Amandine. Um, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here uh, with you to talk about how to go from carbon neutrality at company scale to collective action towards global net zero. I will start by explaining why we're talking about carbon neutrality and how companies can act towards this goal. Um, next slide. Please. <laughs> um, so if you're here uh, listening to this webinar, I guess you probably already know that climate change is happening. Um, the average temperature has already risen by more than one degree. And we are starting to feel it and see it very concretely um, this summer, for example, with droughts, fires and very high temperatures. So the warning from the IPCC is clear. Um, climate change is a threat to human well-being and planetary health. But what we don't talk about that often is that there are solutions already available. The IPCC says that mitigation options available could reduce drastically greenhouse gases emissions in less than a decade. A few examples in the food, agriculture and land use sector, which is our topic today, um, conservation agriculture, improved manual management, nutrient management, plant-rich diets. So work we less. What we lack most today is not solution, but collective actions to actually implement them. And that's what we are going to focus on today, solutions in agriculture. So let's go to the target, carbon neutrality by 2050. The IPCC scenarios show the emission trajectory needed on a global scale to contain global warming. On the right, you can see scenarios of emissions, and on the left, you can see the, comp the corresponding temperatures. So the scenario we want to focus on is, is the light blue one. Um, this is the one that matches the Paris Agreement. It's uh, the one that keeps the increase in the average temperature of the planet well below 2 degrees. Well below, containing warming to well below 2 degrees should reduce the risk of reaching a tipping point which will lead to abrupt and irreversible changes in climate and thus have catastrophic effects. And the pathways that limit warming well below two degrees involve two things. First, a rapid and deep and immediate greenhouse gas uh, emissions reductions in all sectors this decade. We need to cut global GHG emissions by nearly half by 2030. And also we need to reach global net zero emissions in the early 2050s. What is carbon neutrality or net zero? It means causing no overall increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So this means that each year we remove as much CO2 uh, from the atmosphere as we have emitted. In practice, uh, carbon neutrality looks like very few emissions, less than 10% 
of current emissions and carbon removal to effectively remove those few remaining emissions from the atmosphere. So to achieve this, we need to both reduce emissions and increase carbon sinks, such as forests and soils. Society see that it is every company's responsibility to participate in climate change mitigation. Here are the three pillars of a carbon strategy, measure, reduce, and contribute. We often see offset, but we have changed it here for contribute, you will understand why. Measure, it's obviously very important to understand your impact and know where the level for actions are. And of course, it is not good enough to measure your emission and stop there. What's important is to reduce emissions. So the second step is to reduce your emissions uh, within your perimeter and in your value chain. And at the same time, contribute to reduce greenhouse gases emission beyond your value chain. Unfortunately, companies are tackling the issue one step at a time and many are putting off the reduction of greenhouse gases beyond their value chain. But we don't have time to wait until 2050. Um, so this is why it's important to reduce and at the same time contribute. That's why contribution is an essential pillar for any serious climate strategy. And some companies have already understood that very well. Here you can see some of our customers. Um, and as you can see, there are sectors that are not related at all to agriculture, such as IT, consulting, media, or industry, leisure. And by funding agriculture projects, what they want to is to contribute to global emission reduction. They want to be seen as climate leaders and they want to contribute to the resilience of their territories. Investment in carbon certificates is an effective tool to contribute to reduce emission beyond your value chain. So how to navigate in the voluntary carbon market? You may have heard, you may have seen a few articles about VERA projects. Um, it, it's like these scandals have discredited the whole voluntary carbon market. So let's take a look uh, a bit deeper at these projects. These are forest protection projects where it is believed that the funding will prevent deforestation from happening. And some studies conducted show that the risk of deforestation was most of the time overestimated so there were more carbon credits generated than what would actually have been avoided in terms of emissions related to deforestation. What's important to keep in mind is that these are very specific projects where we try to prevent something from happening, imagine what would happen if we do nothing. So by definition, it's very difficult to estimate. And these projects have this weakness, but the voluntary carbon market brings together a high variety of projects in terms of operation, methodology, locations. And it's really a shame that these articles paralyze the whole market because this is not a market issue. This is not even a VERA issue because VERA offers lots of different projects. This is really specific to these deforestation projects. Imagine one day you buy a sandwich and it tastes really, really bad. Are you going to say, ah, oh, I will never eat ever again? No, right? That wouldn't be very reasonable. Will you say, I will never eat a sandwich anymore? No. Maybe you'll say, okay, next time I want a sandwich, I will be more picky. What are the ingredients? Are they fresh? Can I see some customer reviews maybe? Or maybe you'll even ask, do producers get their fair share? It's exactly the same with a carbon certificates, you can be picky and you should. So let's remember the voluntary carbon market offers many high quality projects and we need carbon finance to meet global climate targets. So maybe you'll think, okay, but how can I assess the quality of a project if I'm not an expert? This is where local contribution can be interesting because today, the majority of carbon credits are for projects in thousand countries. And of course, this project needs funding, but we also need funding for local projects in Europe 
to reduce emission and increase carbon storage in Europe. And one advantage of local contribution is that it allows a high level of project monitoring and proximity because all certified projects will have a good level of transparency. Um, there are reports and planning and following the projects, but it can be difficult to assess a project's relevance and quality in a country, in a context that is very far from us. So proximity is important as it helps to understand the project and assess its quality, even for non-experts. And so in Europe, legislation is evolving to provide a clear framework for European projects. Um, Andrew will explain it in details further in the presentation. And also, if you want to be picky, you may be interested in co-benefits of the project beyond carbon. And that's an advantage of nature-based solution is that they generate multiple co-benefits beyond carbon. Andrew will also explain that in detail. At Agoterra, we are truly committed to restore confidence in the voluntary carbon market. So that's why our commitment is to bring high quality, transparency, proximity. Transparency, that means working closely with our partners to provide companies with as much information as possible on the project they fund and during the whole life of the project. Information is available and updated on a dedicated platform. And we also offer companies the opportunity to visit farms and meet the farmers that they're funding to understand re the real impact of their funding. And you know, even when things are not 100% perfect, when things don't go as planned, which happens in agriculture, we inform the company and explain. In this market, communication is key. And um, there is a lot of criticism of the way companies communicate about carbon credits. We, some, we sometimes hear that carbon certificates are a license to pollute. Here you can see the results of a study that analyzed about 100 companies reporting to the carbon disclosure project. And what it shows is that companies that buy carbon credits actually reduce their direct emissions faster than others. So instead of being a license to pollute, investment in carbon credits usually indicates a genuine commitment to decarbonization. So the issue is more about communication around carbon certificates. Why is it a problem to communicate about carbon neutral company or carbon neutral project? Well, first, because a company or a product always has an impact. We've seen ads about, for example, carbon neutral, carbon neutral plane journey. And this is obviously misleading about the climate impact of it. And also behind the notion of carbon neutrality at company level can hide very different realities. Here on the left, you can see a company that has increasing emissions and which is offsetting more and more to counterbalance its impact. And this is obviously not in line with a global two degree pathway. And on the right, you can see a company that reduces its emissions following a pathway that is in line with a two degree scenario and which also contributes to global carbon neutrality. So just by saying carbon neutrality at company level, we cannot know uh, the climate ambition and actions of the company. So that's why trust in offsetting claim is falling. And my major players are dropping carbon neutral claims. <clears throat> in addition to society's critique on carbon neutrality claims, regulation is also evolving. In France, since last year, um, law stipulates that companies that want to make a carbon neutrality claim in advertising have to produce lots of information. And the spirit of this law is that it is costly and very demanding, and it will discourage most of companies from making these claims. And now in Europe, um, this September, the European Commission voted a law that will ban companies from claiming that their products are climate neutral. So if carbon neutral claims are not to be used anymore, how to communicate? 
here are a few tips. First, show the big picture. Contribution is part of a broader carbon strategy. So you could disclose annual GHG inventory, emission reduction targets, how your company is on track towards these targets. Also be factual and accurate. It's important to specify your role in the supported project, such as how much funding, what is the carbon impact. Also be humble, never deny your impact because every company and every project has an impact and make your action part of a collective effort. Communicate about contribution to global carbon net zero as carbon neutrality only makes sense on a global scale. And of course, it's even better to convey a message that encourages responsible behavior. <clears throat> so we have to acknowledge that neutrality claims were an easy way to communicate to customers. They were recognized as a competitive edge, but consumers don't trust these claims anymore. Contribution to carbon neutrality, to global carbon neutrality, it's true, it's a bit more difficult to directly communicate to customers. So we have identified five drivers that are clear sources of business value for companies investing now in carbon certificates to contribute to global carbon neutrality. First, be recognized as a company with a robust and serious climate strategy. In comparison, offsetting and neutrality claims are now considered as not reliable. To develop a competitive edge by anticipating upcoming regulation and meeting society's growing expectation. For example, the due diligence directive will require companies to integrate climate performance into due diligence processes when evaluating potential suppliers. So this means that making your fair contribution to global net zero, it can help you outcompete others for business. Three, secure your carbon certificate needs at beneficial pricing. Because as demand drives up faster than supply, we expect prices of high quality carbon certificates to increase. And if you act now with long-term contracts that secure beneficial pricing, it will be cheaper. If you delay, it will be more costly for your company. Four, it, you can increase stakeholders buy-in investors, customers, suppliers, and also it can increase talent attraction and retention. And finally, it can help you improve the resilience of the communities on which you depend. Customers, workforce, suppliers, they all face physical and transition related risks due to climate change. A nature-based project that generates multiple environmental and social co-benefits can help them improve their resilience. And we all know that resilience to shocks is going to be more and more business critical. So to sum up, to limit global warming below two degrees, we need to drastically reduce emissions during this decade and achieve carbon, achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. The challenge is huge, but the good news is that solutions exist and they are already available. Contribution beyond value chain is an essential pillar of any climate strategy. And carbon certificates are an efficient tool to help achieve emission reduction or CO2 removal. In terms of mindset and of communication, it's key to shift from offsetting and carbon neutrality at company level to collective action towards global net zero. Contribution brings clear sources of business value to your company. Thank you, Claire. Um, I now give the floor to Andrew to dive a bit deeper in how a regenerative agriculture project works and how it relates to the global net zero objective. Thank you, Amandine, and thank you so much, Claire, for that. In my section, I'm going to answer three key questions. First of all, how does regenerative agriculture or agriculture more generally, in fact, relate to global net zero? Secondly, how does a regenerative agriculture transition program work in practice? And thirdly, what impact can we see on the ground 
from regenerative agriculture in practice. So let's start with that first question of the link between agriculture and global climate change. Now, many of you may be familiar with this type of chart, which puts the contribution of agriculture, forestry and other land use to global emissions at something around 25% of global emissions. Now, a lot of that is to do with land use change. For example, the emissions associated with deforestation to clear land for arable and other forms of agriculture. But in fact, how we farm today is also part of the climate problem. And to understand this, we need to know where carbon is stored on planet Earth. So here is a diagram on the next slide that helps you visualize where carbon is stored on, on planet Earth. This diagram is highlighting all of the different pools and stocks of carbon. So for example, I've highlighted fossil fuels, 5,000 petagrams of carbon, give or take. A petagram is 10 to the power 15. The atmosphere stores something like 830 petagrams of carbon. But did you know that the soil is a major carbon store as well? Anywhere between one and a half thousand and 2,400 petagrams of carbon. Now this matters because as we see on the next slide, modern industrial agriculture is actually part of co the cause of carbon being released from our soils and into the atmosphere. You know, we've become in Europe and North America in particular, very normalized to seeing monocultures that are regularly sprayed with agrochemicals, regular applications of manufactured fertilizer, and in particular, with land that is bare after heavy plowing, heavy tillage, ready for the next crop. We're used to that, but perhaps what is not so obvious to us is that the biological health of our farmland soils has been steadily degrading ever since the uh, advent of modern industrial agriculture. The natural fertility of our soils has been plummeting because of what we have been doing to the soils, but in particular from a carbon point of view, through the heavy tillage and the bare soil, we have been exposing the carbon that has been stored in that soil up until now with the oxygen in the air. And when carbon meets oxygen, CO2 is formed. And so this is why modern industrial agriculture plays such a significant role in a net flow of carbon from the soil to the atmosphere. But regenerative agriculture can fix this. And before I go any further into describing regenerative agriculture, let me say very clearly that regenerative agriculture does not distract us at all from having a productive, good yielding agriculture system. But instead of seeing problems, pests and fertility problems, and responding with chemical or mechanical solutions, regenerative agriculture looks to learn from nature and take nature-based or biological approaches to solving those same problems. And as you see here from the industry adopted definition of regenerative agriculture, it's a system of farming that delivers as outcomes improvements in soil health as we farm, improvements in biodiversity starting in the soil, better water management, and overall the potential to flip agriculture from being a net source of carbon flowing into the atmosphere into a net sink of carbon drawing it down. And that's before we start talking about the farming business benefits. Now, you may be wondering, how does that carbon get into the soil? Well, we've known for a long time that carbon is closely associated with organic matter in the soil. And for example, plant residues um, form part of that organic matter, which are then decomposed to allow carbon to be released into the soil. 
It's only relatively recently that we've come to understand the role of photosynthesis in putting carbon into the soil. And simply put, you can see on the diagram here that when plants are absorbing CO2 as part of photosynthesis process, they convert it into carbohydrates, plant sugars. They use up to 50% of those carbohydrates themselves, but they actually push out the other 50% into the soil through their roots. They exchange those carbohydrates with life in the soil, bacteria and fungi in particular, in order to get from them micronutrients that they can't access on their own. And so healthy plants in a healthy soil that are photosynthesizing are acting as a pump to take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into the soil. So what does regenerative agriculture look like in practice now that you have that visibility? Well, five key principles emerge. We minimize synthetic inputs like agrochemicals and fertilizers. They disrupt the biology in the soil. We minimize soil disturbance through plowing because that also disrupts in particular the fungal networks in the soil that those plants are depending on. We maximize the use of cover crops, which keep soil covered in between our cash crop and the photosynthetic pump continuing to work. We make sure that we have as much biodiversity working as possible within our agricultural system so that that biodiversity is reflected below ground in the soil as well. And we make sure to adapt all of this to the local context of a specific farm. There are no shortcuts or cookie cutter approaches in agriculture. And just to give you a little vision of how this can look in practice, this is a farmer in Belgium planting his wheat. Normally you would see this tractor operating on bare soil with probably heavily plowed or tilled surface matter. Here, what you see is a multi-species cover crop. That's the standing biomass on the right. You can see sunflowers in there, the yellow and various other species like Facelia as well. The farmer has rolled that cover crop using a mechanical roll, so no additional chemicals being used. And he's directly drilling his wheat seeds through that cover in order to keep the soil covered as much as possible. Now, you might ask, why aren't all farmers doing this if it has such appeal? There are three key reasons when you talk to farmers and study the academic literature. They hear a lot that they should fear loss when they transition practices. Loss in terms of yields, loss in terms of profitability. They know that they are going to need more technical knowledge to make this work and they lack appropriate knowledge either directly themselves or through their advisors. And finally, the market isn't pulling them in that direction. The crop market that buys their produce isn't yet demanding this as a matter of course. And so when you add all this up, it looks like a significant risk to change the fundamentals of how they farm with these kinds of barriers in front of them. And remember, farmers in the value chain probably bear the most risk and have the thinnest margins. So let's come on to the second key question. How does a regenerative agriculture transition program actually work in practice? And I'm talking here from the experience of soil capital, of course. So the first thing to say very clearly is that today we at Soil Capital are using carbon and greenhouse gases as a leading indicator of the broader regenerative agriculture outcomes that we can expect to see. So we are certifying the climate impact of regenerative agriculture. And the process starts as it should with farmers. They're in control of what they do. And it's our role as soil capital to make it as easy as possible for them on an annual basis to share their farming practice data with us for us to quantify their climate impacts as a result. We provide them with insights on their performance and we support them on their improvement journey. Everything we do, our entire program, is certified against an external third party standard from the ISO family. I'll say a bit more about that later. 
And under the protocol that we therefore have, every one ton of CO2 equivalent improvement against the farmer's baseline is quantified and recognized. Now, since we don't participate in offset markets, we've always called those units carbon certificates, which is what Claire was talking about earlier. These certificates are purchased by companies as an investment in their contributions to global net zero. And this generates a new revenue for farmers to incentivize them to take the risk that I was talking about just a few moments ago. So what we have here is essentially a performance based payments system for farmers. Now, as you might expect, there's much more to this from the farmer's point of view. I won't go into this slide in detail. We can talk more about this if, you, if you'd like to in questions. But to summarize, farmers need trust, they need data-driven insights, and they need good advice to make their transition a success. And every step of the way, we have a very conscious methodology to help deliver that. A key question that Claire raised earlier was how to know if a program is high integrity. And there are many ways to define high integrity today. Most come from the voluntary carbon markets. But as Claire indicated, there is a regulatory answer to this question coming in Europe. And in fact, it's already on the statute books because the EU has a carbon removal certification framework in its last stages of, of progress through the EU institutions. That regulation puts forward four criteria for high integrity carbon removals, including in carbon farming. And they work off this acronym, the quality criteria. So I'll work through these briefly. The first one is quantification. How do you measure the improvements? Well, in farming, the options are to do direct soil analysis, to use models, or to use remote sensing satellites. And what seems to be emerging from the European Union process is that they see a hybrid approach of these different techniques as best practice. And that's exactly what we do today. You can see here the logos of two third parties, Regrow Ag and the Cool Farm Alliance, that we work with for model uh, based data and remote sensing. Those are both widely regarded in their sectors globally. On additionality, the EU wants to see regional baselines used so that farmers that are already early adopters of relevant practices are included. We do that already, specifically for farmers that join our program and have a profile that is better than net zero, but it's something that we're already implementing. On long-term storage, this relates to the principle of permanence and the European approach seems to be moving to a position of recognizing that permanence does have a different meaning in a farming context as compared to in a geological carbon storage context, for example. The EU process has done a review of certification processes that already exist around Europe and further afield. And it's concluded so far that a permanence period in carbon farming of less than 10 years seems too short. We are already engaging farmers for 15 years as a matter of course, and have been doing that for the last three years. And the final quality criteria is sustainability. I'm going to talk about that in much more detail in the final section. There are two additional criteria that the European Union regulation um, mentions quite forcefully, using third party auditors, something we've been doing since the beginning, and using a publicly accessible registry, again, something we've been doing from the beginning. So I'll turn now to what results and impact we see in practice from a regenerative agriculture program in operation today. And this is important because as we said at the beginning, the benefits of regenerative agriculture are broad. We're using carbon as a leading indicator. And so some people argue that uh, programs that do that can adopt what they call carbon tunnel vision, become too narrowly focused on carbon. Now we're comfortable from an agronomic point of view that there are lots of reasons why that shouldn't happen and isn't happening. But it's really important to use data 
and to analyze whether that is happening rather than just rest on your laurels. So the first question I, I ask here is, are current carbon payments even meaningful for farmers? Are they attractive? And that question is relevant because many would argue that current valuations of carbon are simply too low. Well, the way we look at that is we look at the growth of our program. We don't offer farmers prepayments. We offer them payments for results. And what you can see here over the course of three years is that we've attracted more than 1,000 farmers across three countries, France, Belgium, and the UK, representing something like just under 300,000 hectares. And I think it's actually more easy to understand why that's happening when you focus on the average earnings of a French farmer, for example, which the French government states is just under 18,000 euros. And when you put alongside that the fact that at our last payment to farmers, we paid farmers just under 8,000 euros per farm for their performance, you can see that actually this is making a meaningful um, contribution to farmer income. The next question I ask is, does a revenue incentive deliver practice change? That's a key assumption that we make in our program. The answer simply is yes, for the most part. Now, some schemes tell farmers what to do. They prescribe practices. Uh, we take a different approach. We leave farmers in control. We think that's better for ownership. Now, what you can see on the chart here is uh, uh, a graph where each line, each vertical line, represents a single farm. If it's red, it's a net emitting farm. If it's green, it's a net storing farm. Now, I don't know whether you can actually see the movements of these bars today. If you can't, we'll make sure you can in follow up. But what I can tell you from this data where we track the progress of our first 100 farmers over three years, is that eight, uh, in the last year alone, 75% of farms recorded a year-on-year -year improvement in their greenhouse gas balance. The red portion of that chart is getting smaller, the green part is getting bigger, and that is simply showing us that practice change is happening as a result of the revenue incentive, and step by step, farmers are moving along their journey to more regenerative systems. A follow-up question we might ask is, okay, we have this incentive, and yet are we sure that farmers are actually changing their whole farming system rather than just looking for silver bullets, the easy wins, the low-hanging fruit, which wouldn't relate to a whole system change and uh, an approach that would be regenerating soil health. Well, we track the underlying farming practice data of the farmers in our program, and we have that verified. And what this graph is showing you is that for the certificates that were generated for carbon removals, more than 75% came from fields where at least two different soil improvement practices were being implemented in the same field that year. In fact, for more than 25% of payments, they came from fields where three soil improvement practices were being implemented at the same time. And I think this does give us reassurance that we are looking more and more at farmers taking a whole systems approach to change. And finally, Let's ask this question of, are these practices actually delivering the co-benefits that Claire talked about at the beginning? Well, in fact, the European Commission has a really helpful resource here where they've aggregated evidence from the academic literature. They've sorted it, they've graded it in terms of quality, and that allows everybody to see what the science is telling us about the implementation of these, of these farming practices. So, for example, when farmers establish cover crops in between their cash crops, we know from the scientific literature that biodiversity improves. Specifically, 
we see improvements in the soil's biological quality. We also know that we see water benefits from decreased nutrient leaching and runoff and decreased soil erosion. And just as importantly, we know we can see food security implications, benefits from increased crop yields, especially when legumes are present in cover crop mixes. Now, it's easy to keep this kind of conversation quite conceptual, but at the heart of all of this are human beings, farmers. And as Claire indicated earlier, just as for soil capital, we organize farm visits for companies that are supporting uh, the transition of farmers. We know that the connection to those farmers is terribly important. And so before I end, I want to bring some of the farmers' voices into the room. And I want to do that by showing you a short video. Ils disent que l'autre jour j'ai entendu une réunion, les sols sont morts. Je dis au gars, viens avec moi une nuit, tu prends ta pile, on va les regarder. Non, les sols sont pas morts. On a, on est, je pense qu'on est à un, un stade où on a encore moyen de les faire revivre. On a encore moyen de retrouver. Et moi, ce que je recherche, il y a un mot que j'adore énormément, c'est la résilience. Quoi. un peu des enjeux du carbone en agriculture. Donc euh, je m'appelle Johan Pinault. Je suis Jean-Marc Prudhomme. Je m'appelle Olivier. Jean-Henri Mazran, agriculteur céralier dans le Nord Charente. Je me suis installé en 2003 en conventionnel et je suis aujourd'hui en intégralité semi-direct, agriculture de conservation. On essaye de faire de plus en plus de, de semi-direct sur la ferme. Il y a des choses qui, 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 ont, qui se sont déclenchées, c'est-à-dire que j'ai travaillé sur l'exploitation. Mes parents labouraient, on avait un tracteur d'une certaine puissance avec euh, une charrue de avec six corps derrière. Et sept ans après, je reviens sur l'exploitation, ils font un tracteur plus puissant, avec une charrue plus petite. Et on voit toujours que le, tra le tracteur avait du mal à travailler. Et je me suis dit, c'est pas possible. Il y a un problème, il y a quelque chose qui ne va pas. Et je me suis tout de suite tourné vers le, vers le sol. Je me suis dit, dans le sol, il y a quelque chose qui ne va, qui, qui va plus. Quoi. On a une exploitation plutôt orientée céréalière. On y fait du blé, orge, colza, tournesol, maïs. Luzerne a deux, deux destinations, une luzerne, une luzerne pour le fourrage, une luzerne pour les porte-graines. Et on espère pouvoir à terme déplafonner les rendements, produire plus grâce à toutes les actions qu'on a mises en place. Les premiers résultats sont déjà tombés. Sur quelques années, sur quelques cultures, on a obtenu des rendements qu'on n'avait jamais obtenus auparavant. Au niveau rendement, je sais que quand je discute avec les voisins, je n'ai pas forcément l'impression d'être au-dessus ou en dessous. Je ne pense pas avoir baissé en rendement. Après, par contre, en nombre de passages dans les champs par rapport aux voisins, ouais, j'ai une grosse différence. Ouais. <rire> je passe beaucoup moins dans les champs. Ouais. Mon but, c'était voilà, d'optimiser mon sol, stocker de la matière organique, faire des couverts végétaux, diminuer les, les coûts de mécanisation. Pour vendre mes certificats carbone, je souhaiterais les vendre à des gens avec qui, avec qui on travaille déjà. Pourquoi pas euh, des, des marchands de matériel agricole qui ont besoin de limiter leur empreinte carbone. Pourquoi pas avec des, euh, des semenciers, pourquoi pas euh, avec des coopératives, avec tous les gens qui, qui gravaient autour de nous au plus près. La profession agricole ne doit pas être la seule à supporter la lutte contre le réchauffement climatique. On a besoin que tout, tout le monde se sente concerné. Moi, je trouve qu'ils m'ont remis au centre de l'agronomie. On espère que notre sol a de la considération pour nous, parce que nous, on en a pour lui. Et on s'est rendu compte que, en fait, les sols, j'ai l'impression que plus on leur fout la paix, et, et mieux ça marche. Hein. Great, uh, thank you, Andrew. So we'll now move on to the Q&A. Uh, so we already have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one being on the permanence of carbon in the soil. So what is the duration over which the farmer commits to capture CO2 and keep CO2 in the soil? Uh, Andrew, would you like to answer that first one? Yes, I'm happy to elaborate on, on that, Amandine. It's a good question. It's a very common question. I alluded to to it briefly in my remarks, but maybe maybe too too quickly. Um, you know, the, the, the whole goal from a climate point of view of rewarding carbon removals is, of course, to 
um, take carbon out of the atmosphere and keep it locked up there permanently. And then what we have are uh, seemingly endless debates about what is enough permanence. And as I said, um, the conversation at a European level where we're talking about carbon removals in farming, but also in manufactured products and in geological storage and industrial solutions, permanence can, can realistically mean very different things in those different sectors. So concretely, in our program, where we are today is that farmers sign up for a total of a 15, one five year commitment. Um, the first five years of that period, they are making practice changes. Each year, their performance is being quantified. Each year, they're generating a payment for themselves. But they're not being paid for all of their performance in that first five years because they then have to keep the carbon that they've added to the soil in the soil for a further 10 years. And so when you add that to the final fifth year, you get to 15. We monitor the, the farms um, remotely using satellite um, technology uh, in order to inform us and, and be confident that that carbon is staying where it needs to stay. And the reason we're able to use satellite technology is that the main mechanism for carbon to be released from the soil back into the atmosphere, as you might remember from my presentation, is plowing. And you can detect the use of different types of farm machinery fairly easily um, from remote sensing. So the total uh, length of commitment we ask for is, is 15 years. And we find that that's a reasonable balance between um, the sort of time frame that a farmer can commit to. You know, if you ask a farmer to make a commitment over 100 years, then frankly, you get laughed out of their kitchen. Um, but over 15 years, what you'll certainly see from a farm level point of view is the real wider benefits of a change in farming system. Um, we, we will see over that time a much healthier agro ecosystem emerge and that gives us deep confidence that the vast majority of farmers once they are in that kind of system will will stick with it great thank you um and we have a, another question on who exactly is paying for these carbon certificates um so how do we compete with carbon credits sold for offsetting purposes um, Claire, maybe uh, you'd have something to say on that. Um, yeah, well, who is paying for the carbon? Uh, lots of different companies, actually. Um, they have no obligations to do that because it's the voluntary carbon market. Uh, but companies that are buying these carbon certificates have very serious climate strategies and they include the reduction of emissions uh, within their value chain and on their perimeter and also um, reduction on emissions beyond their value chain as it is recommended for example by the SBTI and IPCC and lots of uh, internationally recognized uh, actors. Um, and why are they looking for these kind of credits, um, kind of certificates? Um, because they are looking for uh, lots of time they're looking for local uh, projects um, and also we can um, give them uh, access to project that has um, um, a link to their locations or to their activity. We very often work with projects that are very, very close to their company. Uh, so for example, <laughs> one uh, customer, it's literally like the farm on the other side of the road. So it's very interesting for them to be able to fund these this very local projects. Maybe I could just build on that, Amandine. Um, so from a soil capital mm -hmm. point of view, we're working in just the same way as, as Claire with two main groups for the in terms of who is buying the certificates. One is companies in the agricultural value chain for whom the farmers represent scope three emissions. Very clear business case there. And then the other is those that are outside of the value chain. And, and as Claire says, the local factor is what drives the interest the most. And if I can maybe bring that to life even more, 
Um, for example, we're working with you know a, a Belgian medical technology company that works uh, in a rural business park. Many of its employees live in r rural communities around that business park and therefore have all sorts of social and economic dependencies on the health of the rural economy uh, in that part of Belgium. And so that is one of their core motivations. We've worked with another uh, cosmetics company, uh, a big French brand for whom um, they do use actually uh, farmed raw ingredients in their value chains, but they want to be able to demonstrate that through their climate strategy, they are actively investing in, in French agriculture because that resonates well with their French consumers. Um, so the local dynamic resonates for these different stakeholder groups in quite tangible ways that add business value. Great, I think that makes it very clear. Um, and we have another question on the issue of double claiming um, with regards to contribution. So in particular, if a farmer sells their carbon certification to a company, can that farmer still use uh, this data within their own carbon footprinting um, to be able to reach net zero on their own farms? Um, I don't know, Andrew, would you like to maybe answer that yeah, one? So that's a good question from, I think it was Chloe. Um, so first thing to say is where a transaction is happening within the value chain for scope three reduction purposes, it's widely understood and, and accepted and legitimate for both the farmer and the value chain company to share that claim. Um, that has, has to do with uh, how scope one, two and three accounting works uh, in practice. So for, for that, in that scenario, the farmer is not at risk of, of being blocked from making that claim as well. Um, the question you raised, Chloe, I think does r resonate when um, an offset and compensation transaction is happening because there the credit is being transferred from the farmer to the company outside of the value chain. And it, it's correct that, that no double counting should occur in that in that situation and so farmers are actually nervous uh, around that where we come to contributions um what uh, the, the 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 accounting rules on your question are, are currently being somewhat defined i think um through the sbti process on beyond value chain mitigation and there are different schools of thought about what should be done um, but uh, the, the, the question is very clear in the scope three context, very clear in the compensation context. Claire, would you have anything else to add? Uh, no, you can go to the next question. Yeah, that was good. Perfect. Um, so I think we still have time for one last question. Uh, we had one on biodiversity and if we are measuring um, the impact uh, on biodiversity and other uh, as a secondary benefit um, with our carbon certification. Yeah, thanks, Susan. I'll, I'll take that question. Um, as, as I said, our primary um, focus today is to use climate and carbon as a leading indicator. In order to quantify the climate impact, we are already gathering operational data from farmers that has a direct link to biodiversity, whether that's uh, simply the variety of species that are being planted, but also looking at um, the intensity of tillage and the use of synthetic uh, products, which are all going to have a disruptive effect on uh, biological life. So we have lots of indicators that, that help us. And you might have seen the uh, slide where I was referring to the European Union evidence on how certain practices that we have direct data on are contributing to biodiversity improvements. Now there's much more we could do. Um, and so I'm not trying to conceal that at all. There's much more we could do. And we're actively looking at the right ways to measure biodiversity in a scalable way, uh, building on what we do already, um, but also listening hard to what the market actually will value. Um, one of the projects we're just engaging with in the UK um, is a below ground bioacoustics project, which is using effectively microphone technology to um, 
listen to worm activity and detect not only the quantity of worms in a farmer's soil, but also the species variety. That's very early stage um, science happening, but that's the kind of thing that we get actively involved with in order to uh, drive forward our answer to that, to that very good question. And also, if I may add, um, we are working hard to uh, use agronomic indicators um, into ways of uh, showing the impacts on biodiversity or, or other co-benefits that are un understandable even by non-agronomists and uh, by companies and their cons consumer as well. Great, thank you. Um, so conscious of time, I think we're going to have to wrap it up here. Um, but I'd, we'd like to end this webinar uh, by focusing on the words of Paul Weibrauch, uh, the CEO of Mars, uh, who stated 2050 can seem to be in the distant future, but the progress we make in the next seven years is critical. Companies must be judged on the actual results we deliver against our climate plans, not just the scale of the commitment we make. So despite everything that's been happening in the voluntary carbon market, we simply cannot afford for investment in GHG removal and reduction projects to dry up. Uh, we cannot reach global net zero without restoring natural carbon sinks today. And the, the shift to contribution reminds us that companies play a, a vital role in this process. So we're here to help you reach your contribution goals fast, effectively, and locally. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, there's a quick form you can fill out if you want to continue your sustainability journey with us and also to give us a bit of feedback on today's webinar to improve in the future and if you want to ask some further questions. Um, so there's a QR code to access it or a link in the chat. Um, thank you again everyone for joining today's webinar and we hope, uh, hope to talk to you soon. Thank you.